So it's funny, our podcast last week, which we probably recorded somewhere in the middle of the week, we were talking about how you have this great dip, good time to put your money into the market. And then by Friday, of course, before we published the podcast, uh, markets went straight up again. It was kind of interesting about that. You know, the, the exposure, instead of broadening out, we saw money narrowing in to those big mega cap names again, which is very, very interesting. Well, you know, I think um, one of the recent reports we looked at, there was six trillion sitting on the sidelines in those uh, magnificent money market funds, right? Forget about the magnificent seven, right? We have magnificent money market funds and magnificent three month treasuries at 5.3%. And, you know, I think it, to me, what was, I think, enlightening was that half of that money was institutional money and half was retail. So I think that, um, you know, suddenly when your clients are saying, hey, we making any money in this bull market, you get this rush into, you know, the easiest way to facilitate an investment, which is the S&P 500 capitalization weighted index. Well, it's kind of crazy right now. If you look at just the tech sector, well, I guess it's communication services, which is kind of like tech in the S&P 500. It's a whopping 37% of the entire index. So that means yeah. really, and I use this joke back in the day, but it really is like a tech fun and drag. Like you're not yeah. really getting broad exposure right now, which looks really smart right now because that's what's working. That's what worked last year. But Bob, you know, one thing we always worry about, we think about the past and at some point that starts to look what we like to say is uh bubblicious. Yeah, it really does. I think um, back in 99, the PE rate, the, the weighting got up to about 40%. Um, so we're only 3% you know, from the 99, 2000 uh, bubble before it burst. Uh, but, you know, earnings are going up. I mean, there's there's earnings and there's still some PE room, you know, if you're going to go to the all-time highs on PE. Speaking of all-time highs, right? you know, Friday we had an all-time high finally breached on the uh, S&P 500 after a two-year wait. Seemed like an eternity, not for us, but for some of our listeners. Um, and, you know, the NASDAQ 100 hit an all-time record high. You know, so, you know, the economy is pretty much as good as it gets, right? We have low unemployment. We have inflation that's coming down. Gas prices are dropping. Earnings have been really spectacular. Been a couple of blowups here in this past week, but mostly have been very, very good. So, Bob, what you're telling me is good news is good news? Yeah, actually, good news <laughs> is having a stronger bullish impact because, you know, consumer sentiment came in uh, this week and it really made a big jump. So, People are getting enthusiastic and, and finally starting to put a little smiley face, uh, you know, when they when they look at the news. Yeah, no, it's, it is actually kind of remarkable. Um, you know, last year we heard good news is bad news. Bad news is good news. And I always believe that good news is good news because yeah. the news last year overall was pretty positive, especially the backdrop of so much negativity. But what I also find interesting is what Wall Street loves to do. It loves to obsess on one metric and extrapolates out every move in the market to that one metric. And I think the big one is interest rates driving everything, right? The Fed pivoted at the end of last year. Jay Powell basically said, or the Fed said, all right, we're going to stop raising interest rates. We'll probably start lowering them next year. Markets went straight up. Now that's all Wall Street can focus on. And we know it's much more complex than just what interest rates are doing. Yeah, I think it was like an easy headline though, Rye, right? We went from, okay, are they going to hike again? Are they going to hike again to... Oh, they're going to cut six times. I mean, where the heck did that come from? You know, it's like out of the blue. They're going to cut six times. Um, and, you know, but I don't think it really matters, right? Because, you know, the Fed has a dual mandate and they also have to keep unemployment low. Um, so they're going to fight inflation and look at unemployment. So I, I've been very encouraged by what Jerome Powell's been saying, that he will do what it takes as opposed to, you know, telling everybody he's going to cut rates and the, the economy's dependent on that. Um, I think the economy is very strong right now. It doesn't really need a rate cut. No, I agree with you. And rates went up last week, which conventional wisdom would say, well, the market has to go down and the market did the exact opposite. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's, that's the danger when you focus on one or two metrics because mm -hmm. the economy is very complex, right? We have, to your point, the employment market right now, which is strong as it's been ever historically, basically, you know, more people have jobs than they ever had before. To your point, consumer sentiments really start to go up in a big way. In fact, it had a huge leap last month. And if you look at jobless claims, they've been extremely low, which speaks to further strength in the job market. So, and earnings, right? Earnings so far have been pretty good. And the earnings season is starting to roll along. So, like, to your point, Bob, I and mean, this is like 
pretty much as good as it gets. Doesn't get much better than this. Well, you know, like you said the other day, uh, we get a party like it's 1999. Um, I think in the, in the notes that you sent out to our team this week, you, talk, you spoke about Cisco and how that became the most bubblish stock of all time. And I remember, you know, when Cisco was flying, everybody would call me up and say, I want to buy Cisco. And I said, sure, what do they do? <laughs> and they had no idea. It had something to do with the internet. And I know it's an important stock. And, you know, I'm starting to get the same calls now. Bob, I, I need to own NVIDIA. <clears throat> Actually, one of my clients, 90-year-old um, mother, wanted to know if that was a good stock to buy. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I said, okay, what do they do? Um, I know they have something to do with AI. And, um, you know, I know they're important, right? So it's, again, people just throwing money at something for an idea and a concept. And, you know, like I read Honeywell this week is going to start to incorporate AI, you know, into their systems. Didn't get much of a boost to the stock, but I think that's the whole thing. AI is going to benefit every company. You don't need to be in the best company. Well, it gets a little tricky. Uh, as you and I know, if you look at markets, they go from, they oscillate between fear and greed, right? We saw fear last year. Everyone was panicked. No one wants to be in the market. Now, all of a sudden, the pendulum's starting to swing the other way, right? And to your point, we have $6 trillion sitting in money market funds, you know, investors are kind of in denial right now. They're getting their 5%, but odds are the Fed's probably going to cut this year. We've talked about that a lot. All of a sudden, there's going to be a panic. If markets keep going higher, what am I doing in all this cash? My 5% is going away. Oh my God, let me get into the market. Mm. Of course, they're going to follow the winner. So I think the big risk here is you probably could see a huge melt up in all these hot mega cap stocks. And it's going to make you believe that's where your money has to be. But the problem is when you get a big move up, a big bubblicious move up, the other side of it typically isn't pretty. Well, since I'm fully invested, I, I hope you're right. Um, I'll, I'll deal with the uh, fallout, rise. So, you know, when you're on CNBC or Fox Business this week, promote the daylights out of this bubble, you know, this melt up. I love melt ups, um, but you never know. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, I think for a lot of investors who are sitting there on the sidelines thinking, oh, my goodness, I missed it. Right. Or I have that FOMO. You know, small to mid-cap stocks are still below their all-time high. The equally weighted S&P is not at its all-time high. Um, you have the same thing with international stocks. There's still plenty of opportunity, you know, to deploy your capital, you know, to have it be more productive than, you know, sitting in a money market fund waiting to invest. No, it's true. And I think, again, the big mistake investors will make is they're going to follow that siren song of whatever's hot right now. And meanwhile, you've got bargains everywhere. That's not the mega cap seven, right? But yep. if the mega cap seven keeps going up here, it's going to be really hard not to put a lot of money there. And we've already seen that concentration there. Um, if you look at NVIDIA stock, we've talked about that. I mean, really, since it bottomed out, it's up over 250%. And sure, it can go a lot higher here. But at some point, we know trees don't grow to the sky. Everything goes in and out of favor. Mm -hmm. And when the party stops or the tide goes out, as Warren Buffett says, you can see who's been swimming naked. I think that's the biggest risk investors have here is not being smart, being proactive, diversifying, and then putting blinders on and not getting seduced and putting all your money in one place. But investors, for the most part, aren't really good at doing that. Well, you know, there's going to be some stockbroker out there with a chart saying, I recommended NVIDIA at the end of November, and it's up 252% <laughs> in two months. Do you know what annualized that return is? You should have put all your money with me, right? Um, but I think, you know, I think it's overall, I think the balance looks really quite favorable right now. Um, I love the fact that we spoke about this the last couple of weeks that investors and, you know, most people tend to be skeptical, right? When you talk to your friends and your family about how things are and, and they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's good, but, but why is it good? You know, <laughs> it's like, it's going to get bad. So, you know, you have all that built into the market, you know, meanwhile, governments are gridlocked. we got a presidential year this year. So, you know, I think, uh, most people are waking up to the fact, hey, there was no recession, or at least the, the one that the, you know, they, the economists were predicting. Um, so I think we're going to keep grinding higher here, buddy. That's, that's, that's my view right now. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 146, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you're thinking, I need a more hands-on approach, I wanna get a full review of my portfolio, if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We literally go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue 
you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, best way to take Social Security, best way to draw from your portfolio, factor in inflation without running out of money. We're going to build for you a dynamic income plan that goes up over the rest of your life. We're going to look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile, uncertain over the course of the last two years. Has your portfolio been all over the place like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting in cash paralysis by analysis, even though the Fed's probably going to cut interest rates this year? Well, we're going to put together a full diversified investment game plan tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product. Bob and I will do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce that cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review or click the link below. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. That's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. So Bob, since it's just you and me today and you know financial planning, it's always on our minds. I thought we could have a little fun today, create a little excitement, and we could fill in the blank. I'll start a sentence that has to do with financial planning, and we'll see how good you are after these 55 uh, plus years, <laughs> and you can fill in the blank. Fill in the blank, statement. huh? Okay. Are, you, are you ready? Do you feel good yes. about this? Yes, All I right. do. So the first one would be, the best way to be sure you don't run out of money in retirement is to blank. Oh, invest your money with paying capital management, of course. Um, <laughs> It's not a commercial, Bob. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But no, it's actually what you have to do is make sure that be between your, your spending, right, that you compensate for the biggest, most insidious, heinous tax there is, which is inflation. You have to factor in inflation. You just can't take it back on an envelope and project what your portfolio and your passive income streams are going to be net of your budget. So first of all, you got to have a budget, right? It's got to be realistic. Yeah, no, it's a great point. That's always like ground zero, right? Is figuring out what you spend, which I always say it's a bit of art and science. It's getting all those numbers together off your credit card statements, off those automatic transfers that come out of your account, along with a little back of the napkin math on you know what you might not spend in retirement versus what you might spend in retirement. You know, it takes a lot of what I call uh, mental gymnastics. I used that term yeah. last week because it is kind of intense when you're trying to figure out all those numbers of what you realistically are going to spend or you're spending now in retirement. You know, Rob, I think it does it does make a, a lot of sense, you know, to work with someone with experience. I mean, how many cases have you run where, you know, folks are shocked that they may have nursing home, you know, to pay for or need assisted living at some point, or they see the cost of that, you know, well, health care, um, you know, when we put the inflation numbers on healthcare, what it looks like in your 80s and 90s. Yeah, and that's what a, an online calculator doesn't do. It doesn't stack the cards against you, right? And that's what yep. you want. You want to put, throw the kitchen sink at your plan, look at all the potential healthcare costs that come out, what inflation's going to look like, uh, any other ancillary expenses. A lot mm -hmm. of times, like your travel budget may go through the roof in retirement, yep. but you want to look at all those different expenses you could possibly have. And then look at like, hey, look, if we don't have all these expenses, surprises are in the positive. That should be the goal for everybody is make the surprises in the positive, not the negative when it comes to your financial plan. Well, I think that sums it up, right? Like a great financial advisor, a great financial planner is your advocate and your adversary, right? They, they keep you in check, right? They make sure that you don't make those mistakes. Um, you know, it sounds great. Hey, let's take the entire family to Europe, you know, for a ski trip. Um, you know, and then next year we'll do a safari, right? And, and all of a sudden, you know, they, when you start eating the principle, it doesn't work. And and that's why you need those wealth projections. You need the tools. You need the science, you know, that go along with the art of, of a great financial advisor. All right, Bob. So next statement, the right. stock market has the ability to blank. Confound the majority opinion at the time. My goodness, Rye. You know, <laughs> everybody I've ever met projects the future based on the most recent experience. And they're always wrong. Well, I think the one thing we can say is the experts don't get it right very often. Mm -hmm. And last year is a perfect example. Every expert said bear market, recession. They weren't a little wrong, Bob. They were way wrong. Well, fortunately, you know, I had some really great mentors back in my, in my day at Merrill Lynch. And one of my mentors always said when 
when all the experts agree on one thing, it's going to do the opposite. <laughs> it's just, you know, the obvious information, the obvious trade is always the wrong trade, right? As you always say. It really is. And I think the other thing is when you think about the markets in general, they're very emotional. Mm. Um, they have the ability to make you feel greedy. They make you feel nervous, make you feel sad. Um, so, you know, one of our, our, our big tenants at our firm is you want to tie your investments to your goals, not to what's happening recently in the markets, because that is just a recipe for disaster. Because on any given year, we have no idea what the markets are going to do. Experts like to tell you they think no, they, they know what's going to happen. And that's why it's so, so important to build everything around your goals, because your goals don't move the way emotions do and markets do every day. Well, that's like, you know, you're talking about earlier, speaking earlier in our podcast about your pet peeve, about the focus on the Federal Reserve and, you know, how many experts kept saying, but your own pal said, but your own pal said, well, you know, how come these guys don't know that the Fed is a lagging indicator, right? They're dependent on the data. So whatever they say is meaningless. It has nothing to do with what they're actually going to do. No one yeah. seems to know that. Yeah, you can't take them at face value when, you know, typically they do something different than what they said six months ago. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, their opinion can change on the dime. In fact, I mean, if you looked at the futures market, they were predicting that we were like going to have like, I don't know, 60, 70 percent. They're going to cut rates in March. Mm -hmm. That dropped like a rock within a week. So those projections all went out the window just like that. Sure did. So, you know, those short-term moves are just really, really unhelpful. But more importantly, when it comes to the stock market, if we can talk about has the ability to blank, it also has the ability to generate income over time. Um, bonds have the ability to generate income over time. And you have the ability to create an income plan that's more consistent than the ups and downs of the short-term markets, mm -hmm. which are much more reliable when you're trying to build an income plan for retirement, much, much smarter way to look at investing your money. It's one of the reasons why, you know, value stocks outperform growth stocks over time because of the dividend increases. You know, I go back and I look at some of my investments where, you know, based on my cost basis, I have 19, 20% current yields. Um, <laughs> I'll take that any day over when did the market go up or down today? Yeah, right now you have such a great cash flow rich environment to build that income plan for retirement. And most people aren't doing that. They're sitting in cash. <laughs> getting their 5%, waiting for the Fed to cut so their 5% goes to 3%, um, or they're buying growth stocks or mega cap stocks that pay no dividends. So you have to be really smart and selective here to build your portfolio for the long term for retirement, which brings me to my next statement, Bob, that uh -oh. you need to fill in the blank for, which is you should run the other way if a financial advisor tells you blank. Well, I got a whole list for that one, Rye. You know, the first one is when you hear the word guaranteed, um, you absolutely need to run. Um, guaranteed does not exist in the investment world. That sounds like an annuity, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in all fairness, it's contractually guaranteed by a corporation. Um, but again, that doesn't really mean guaranteed in my mind. Uh, so it's just the anytime you hear guaranteed, I want you to run, not walk to the nearest exit. That's right. And they tell you it's just a thin veneer of insurance on top <laughs> of your investment. That means they're charging you a lot of fees. <laughs> so exactly. and as we like to say, a lot of insurance products and brokerage mm. products are sold, not bought. And you know, a lot of times, Bob, I like your analogy about Chinese food. We use it a lot, but it's like, you know, sometimes that pitch on annuities, income for life or some of these structured products with brokerage firms, they feel so good, they taste so good going down, but you feel so empty later. So you gotta be really careful with some of these pitches that you get from these big brokerage firms. And a lot of times you do need to run the other way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's amazing, right? I think our, our brains are just wired a certain way where certain numbers or certain words, you know, trigger us. I mean, we go back to Halloween, you know, when we had our don't get spooked by the markets fireside chat with our clients. And I remember talking about, you know, advisors were, were getting calls from our clients saying, well, why don't we take everything and just put it in a 5% money market fund? It's guaranteed, you know, 5%, you know, in treasuries or whatever. Um, and we said, well, you know, why wouldn't you just put that into large value or put it into, you know, real estate where they're generating a dividend of 4% plus you get appreciation. And I think, you know, both of those investments went up 5% the next week. Um, and so when you think 5%, that's an annualized number. And I think a lot of times when these advisors or these salespeople make these pitches, you know, they pitch it to something that sounds really good, 
but you know, when you just uh, you know, pull off the cellophane, you find out it's not so hot. <laughs> a lot of that in our industry, buyer beware. You got to yes. be careful out there. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. And Bob, for the record, you and I are doing the podcast today, but Chris is in some sailing event in a foreign country. It's good to be Chris. Yeah, but you know what? He said the, uh, the water is like bath water. It's 82. The air temperature is 80. You got nice trade winds. He's uh, sailing out there in the middle of the ocean around Martinique right now. So um, I'm sure he's thinking about us, though, Ry. That's right. That's right. Sounds just like New York right now, except for it's 20 <laughs> degrees here um, and uh, snow's on the ground. So, But I digress. So, you know, we hear a lot of hoopla about uh, short-term CDs and treasuries. And, you know, again, when it comes to financial planning, it's like you always say, it's not what you make, it's what you take. And what that means is what is your return after you pay the IRS, after inflation? You know, what's your purchasing power, which is really all that matters, so we look at the real return of CDs or treasuries over a one-year period. I think the, there's some pretty shocking numbers, right? Uh, you know, back in 2000, like you got your five and a half percent for a one-year CD. What was the actual return? The post-tax return was negative two percent when you factor in a 25 percent tax rate and a 3.38 percent inflation rate. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a good reason why you want to own municipal bonds and a good reason why. You don't want to depend on a, a money market or a CD rate, you know, to fund your retirement. We're talking about metrics, Bob. Um, one of the metrics that you heard a lot of economists use in the last two years was the inverted yield curve. And that just means that rates short term have been higher than rates long term, right? You get 5% on a short term CD or in a money market fund where you're only getting 4% on a 10 year treasury, or normally it's the other way. You have an upward slope. And this is supposed to be this amazing predictor of when we have recessions. But I looked at the data on this. And if you look at it since 1962, the average, uh, after the yield curve inverts, the average is 589 days, meaning it takes you over a year before we actually go into recession on average. But a lot of times, it's a lot longer than that. Yeah, and I think what the inverted yield curve has been really good historically at predicting um, is a, a crisis, you know, a crisis in, in, the, in, in finance and financial companies. And we did have a crisis, right? We had three regional banks fail, um, but it didn't end up creating a credit crunch is why the economy continued to, you know, move along, actually boom. So, you know, these rules of thumb, they sound great in hindsight. It's hard to pinpoint, you know, when it's going at the time. And again, if you have a diversified portfolio, you use that volatility to, to buy low. Well, it also goes back to just like false advertising because one of the stats I would hear is a hundred percent in the a hundred percent of the time in the past when the yield curve inverted, we went into recession. Well, yeah. I guess that's true. In nineteen sixty six, it only took four years afterwards. <laughs> so, did that really predict it? <laughs> yeah, was it really cause and effect? I'm not so sure. <laughs> well, you can use statistics to pretty much prove anything. Yeah, and I think that's, the, again, going back to just one of those uh, cautionary tales. It's like there's not one stat or one sort of indicator that's going to predict the future. Be very, very careful when you hear those on TV. It's very dangerous. Hey, hope you enjoyed episode 146, Pain Points of Wealth. If this is on Spotify right now, you can like, subscribe to the channel. If this is on iTunes, please give us five stars. Leave a nice little comment below. Let people know how great our podcast is. If this is on YouTube right now, you can like the episode. You can subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind.